Welcome to the 10th annual TechCon. Uh, Daryl, thank you for the uh, uh, the introduction there. We're going to be talking all about NXDN in just a moment, but I would be remiss as the president of the West Central Florida group, which has brought forth the NI4CE repeater system and has, uh, well, it was our, our creation to begin with. We have kept it going. And I think it only fitting that on this day, when we talk about things technical, that we also have a celebration because today is the 23rd anniversary of NI4CE going on the air for the first time from our Verna site in Manatee County. It was 4.52 in the afternoon when we turned 145.43 on for the very first time. And 23 years later, we're still going strong. We've expanded the system just a little bit. We've gone from one site and two repeaters to, well, you'll see how many sites here in just a moment, because in addition to the analog uh, repeaters uh, on VHF and UHF, we also have a very broad NXDN network that continues to grow because the users of NXDN continue to grow with it. Uh, it is a, a reflection of how this new digital mode is being used, how it can be used. And as Daryl mentioned a moment ago, when the internet goes down, a lot of people just, you know, their hair stands up, they freak out, they don't know what to do because the internet is tied with everything. And if you lose the internet in this day and age, you may end up losing a lot of your capability if you haven't thought about contingency plans. So a very happy 23rd birthday to NI4CE and the West Central Florida Group Incorporated. We will continue moving forward uh, as we continue on here in the 21st century and continue making ham radio relevant and modern for everybody, not only in this room, but everybody in West Central Florida. With that, we're going to talk a little bit about NXDN. And as Daryl mentioned, this is going to be kind of an update, but we're also going to be talking about some new things that we're going to be bringing to the forefront with NXDN. And as a preview, for those of you who may have thought about doing something else for our afternoon track starting at 1.30, you're not going to want to miss something that we are going to be premiering this afternoon during that track. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Now, NXDN started out actually with the first repeater at that particular site. It is the ATC Riverview site down on Rodine Road. Since that time, as you can see from the map, we've expanded just a little bit. And very recently, we added our newest repeater to the network, that down at Babcock Ranch Village in South Central Charlotte County. The new repeater there on 442.5125 enhances the coverage in Charlotte County, but more importantly, in a community that is one of these that has grown out of the middle of a pasture, namely the Babcock Ranch Reserve, into a 50,000 population planned community. The folks there, when we have a disaster, when we have the next hurricane, will have portable handheld coverage inside their well-constructed buildings. They had coverage already from our Charlotte South site, but once you go inside many of our new modern buildings that are you know, built like Faraday cages, you've got to be up close and personal with the repeater in order to get out with a handheld. Well, they now have that. In addition, going from the south extreme to the north extreme, our village's Sumter County repeater up there at the very top of the map will be going up on its permanent tower location, also with emergency power, in the very near future. Construction 
got delayed just a little bit, but I look forward to seeing that particular repeater on the air at its permanent site. And that uh, particular repeater will cover most of Sumter County. It will get into Lake County to the east, Citrus County to the west, and Marion County to the north. And one of our motivations for that particular repeater, given the fact that NI4CE also supports the National Weather Service Skywarn program, is that the villages is a very unique situation related to weather service and severe weather coverage. What most of you probably don't realize is that the Sumter County part of the villages gets their warnings from the National Weather Service in Ruskin. The Lake County section of the villages gets their warnings from the National Weather Service in Melbourne. And the Marion County section of the villages gets their warnings from the National Weather Service office in Jacksonville. The Villages was literally built at the convergence of three National Weather Service county warning areas, which makes trying to sort severe weather out, which knows no political boundaries, somewhat difficult. With NXDN, we're able to connect the Skywarn coordinator up there with any office that he needs to be connected with. And that in and of itself is also unique. We've built this system because we believe NXDN is the future for ham radio. Of all of the digital modes that are out there, NXDN is the closest thing by virtue of its FDMA modulation to what we currently experience on analog. It is the clearest, the least complicated of all of the digital uh, modulation modes. And because it is a full-time modulation mode, you're not uh, doing a timeshare like you do with TDMA. It just works. And the other great benefit, as you've heard me talk about for the last several years, is that NXDN, even though it uses one quarter of the bandwidth of our typical wideband 25 kilohertz channels, NXDN actually has a better coverage footprint and operates at a lower signal strength than our 25 kilohertz analog modes. It is a win-win-win situation, and the equipment has been around a while since 2005. We're already on the second generation, and I have it on good authority from some friends of mine at ICOM that a third generation radio is in the works. So NXDN is around, it's been around, it's getting better. What is it? Well, as we said a moment ago, it's six and a quarter kilohertz ultra narrow band. So for every 25 kilohertz channel that we take up with an analog signal, we can actually put four NXDN signals into that same amount of bandwidth. Why is that important? Well, as our population continues to expand, more people want communications. And as more people want communications, we have to be able to provide those lanes of communications. You know, just as our one lane roads have turned into four lane and six lane and eight lane, and in some places, 10 and 12 lanes, well, we've got to be able to do the same thing with our radio resources. As I said a moment ago, it uses FDMA modulation, which is the closest thing to what we've all come to know and love and, and embrace in the analog world. And that makes for very easy to understand audio modulation with some extra benefits, because remember this is digital. And if it's digital, yes, you can do data. The weak signal performance, you can't get any better than this. At minus 116 dBm, 
which is what these radios are guaranteed to be able to demodulate. If you were listening to this on analog, it would be mostly noise. It would be unintelligible in most cases. So when the message needs to get through, be it voice or data or GPS positioning, NXDN gets the job done. As I said a moment ago, the first generation radios have been around since 2005. And what was the genesis for NXDN? Well, the FCC put out a report and order in December 2004 that said, this is what we want ultra narrow band digital radio to be. Their concept was six and a quarter kilohertz, FDMA modulation, and a data rate of 4,800 baud. Doesn't get any more complicated than that. NXDN evolved because two major radio manufacturers, ICOM and Kenwood, said, okay, we're going to take this, and we'll see if we can come up with something. And in fact, they had already been in the laboratory working on it, you know, you know how those mad scientists are. And in fact, NXDN is six and a quarter kilohertz, FDMA modulation, data rate of 4,800 baud, be it voice or data. So it hit the mark. The second generation radios have been around now for nine years. It's been that long. The second generation radios brought with them some additional features. Uh, one of them is over the air alias, which for all of us in this room, and for those of you out there watching on YouTube, that's a godsend. Because if you look at part 97 and the rules, it states you must identify your station at least every 10 minutes. With over the air alias, on NXDN, you have the opportunity to identify your station every time you press the push to talk. It's that simple. You put your call sign into the over-the-air alias text field in the programming, and when you press push to talk, that over-the-air alias is automatically transmitted as part of the stream. You identify your station every single time. One of the other things that also was an improvement with the second generation radios was the ability to selectively scan the RF frequency that you were on for multiple talk groups. One of the really neat things with NXDN is you can segmentize the traffic that flows over that RF carrier. Now here in Florida, and we'll get into this in just a a moment with uh, greater clarity. We have set up on the NXDN network multiple talk groups. Think of it this way. In the analog world, we use 146.52 and 446 straight up as call channels. So if you want to call somebody, you do it on those two frequencies, particularly if you're operating in a non-repeated mode. In a repeated mode, you just simply throw your call out there, you call for somebody, hopefully they come back. Well, in the NXDN world, we may have several different things going on at the same time. It is not a one-size-fits-all. We may have some traffic going on Talk Group 1200, which effectively becomes the call channel or the call talk group for NXDN here in Florida. In other parts of the country, it's likely going to be something else. But here in Florida, it's Talk Group 1200. But if you're in Charlotte County, as an example, and they have something going on in Charlotte County, and now that they have three repeaters, you're more than likely going to hear that traffic on Talk Group 1215. And... There may be some other event going on, such as the emergency exercise that took place last weekend in Manatee and Sarasota County that used 
not only Talk Group 1200, but also use Talk Group 1231, which is a tactical talk group that we've set up in the big scheme of things so that we can segmentize that traffic, put it off over here so it's not bothering folks where they don't have an emergency going on, or they may have their own emergency going on, and we have three other tactical talk groups that they can potentially use. One of the other things that we're still working on, and we have a mad scientist in the name of Tom Chance, K9XV, who is uh, uh, writing the code for this, because NXDN also supports GPS for automatic vehicle location, or in the case of an emergency exercise or the real thing like we had last weekend, automatic personnel location, APL, will soon in the near future be able to take your GPS traffic that you've generated on NXDN on talk group 14439. And for those of you who know anything about APRS, you know, it, it's just one of those natural things. But GPS traffic will be routed on talk group 14439. And once it is captured by NX Core, it will then be rerouted to APRS served. And of course, it's no accident that the NI4CE system has. APRS digipeters at all of our analog sites so that if you're on APRS on the analog side, you'll be able to see that GPS traffic coming from NXDN. Pretty cool. Now, we've talked about some of the things that are part of NXDN. We have two different modes. We've got conventional mode and we've got trunking mode. The trunking mode, we're not using an amateur radio. Conventional mode is getting, us, getting it done very nicely. And because we're doing everything that we're doing on the network in conventional mode, we've got significant interoperability between the equipment manufacturers. So it doesn't make any difference whether you have a Kenwood radio or an ICOM radio like this one or a Kenwood radio. Both of them interoperate in, in, in uh, conventional mode with voice traffic. And even though all of our repeaters happen to be ICOM, for reasons I'm not going to get into, but it works and... We went down that road, so, hey, we're there. If you've got an ICOM radio, you get into the repeater just fine. If you've got a Kenwood radio, you get into that repeater just fine. And there are a couple of other manufacturers, primarily with specialty NXDN products, that are out there manufacturing, and their radios work in conventional mode just fine. Now... There are a couple of proprietary things out there related to NXDN because for whatever reason, ICOM and Kenwood, who are the two main players, just decided to go off on their own direction. Things like text messaging and GPS are handled a little bit differently depending upon who the manufacturer is. We're working to try and bring that together on the network. So if you've got a Kenwood and you send a message, that it will somehow come out on the ICOM radios and vice versa. At the moment, it doesn't, but we're continuing to work on it. People ask, well, where can I find an NXDN radio? Because you go online and you go to your favorite ham radio store, whatever that may be. It may be ham radio outlet. It may be uh, gigaparts. It may be DX engineering, or it could be, you know, somebody that I haven't mentioned here. 
and you're going NXDN and they, you know, you get the deer in the headlights look. Well, for whatever reason, good, bad, or indifferent, when NXDN was introduced, it was created, first of all, as a Part 90 land mobile radio product. You know, those are the guys who, you know, have the licenses between four, 450 and 470, or in certain markets, 450 to 512. And Kenwood and ICOM decided we're not going to introduce NXDN into the amateur radio market in part because, you know, ICOM already had D-Star out there and so did Kenwood. So this would potentially be a conflict in a, in a competition. The bottom line is if you want to buy an NXDN radio, if you want to get involved with this very exciting forward-looking mode, you have to find a land mobile radio dealer to purchase it from. There are many. And as a disclaimer, yeah, my day job is as an ICOM LAN mobile radio dealer. There's the disclaimer. But the bottom line is, if you want to buy, you've got to buy, not necessarily from me, you can buy it from any ICOM dealer, any Kenwood dealer. And with the internet, they're not that hard to find. Will the traditional amateur radio retailers ever have NXDN? I think at some point, ICOM and Kenwood will take the wraps off of that limitation. I don't know when it's going to be, if it'll be in the next year, the next two years, the next five years. But as NXDN grows in the amateur radio marketplace, I think they will do it. Now, when we talk about amateur versus LAM mobile radio, the amateur radio market, you've got amateur radio frequencies only, whereas LAM mobile's got the entire amateur radio band when you look at the hardware. If I take this, this radio right here, this radio will do the entire amateur radio band, 420 to 450. It will do the entire LAN mobile radio band, 450 to 470. And embedded within that LAN mobile radio set of frequencies, you also have GMRS and FRS. So if you've got a radio that only does ham frequencies versus a radio that does a whole bunch of other stuff that is now coming into play with a lot of emergency communications uh, paradigms and protocols, which radio would you rather have? Technical support? Well, there's technical support all over the place for both ham radio only radios as well as land mobile. And in fact, I can tell you for, for, uh, from having done it that if you call ICOM tech support, those guys handle the whole scheme of things. And at ICOM, their, their marketplace is not only amateur radio and land mobile, it's also marine and aviation. So the folks there are really well-versed in all things radio. Want to bring this up, and this is an appropriate time since it's up on the screen. In the land mobile radio marketplace, You've got really two different uh, sets of bands. As I mentioned, this radio right here will do 400 to 470 megahertz. Okay. There is a version of that radio and most land mobile radios that do 450 to 512. And that's because in the scheme of things, there are some markets around the country Miami, Atlanta, Chicago, New York, Washington, Dallas, the big cities on the West Coast, where there's this animal called T-band. What is T-band? Well, 
here in, in the Tampa Bay market, we have television stations between channels 14 and channels 20. You go to Miami, you will not find a television station on any of those channels because it is reserved for land mobile radio. Remember we said a moment ago that the FCC was trying to figure out a way to squeeze more stuff into the bandwidth? Well, in Miami, it came squirting out both sides, and they said, we can't get everything that we need in that 20 megahertz of bandwidth for land mobile radio, so they still have T-band, which operates 470 to 512 megahertz. As a result, the manufacturers have a low split radio and a high split radio. Here's why this is important to all of us as hams. There are these radios out there, and the common denominator for a high split and a low split is that 450 to 470 part of the band, where the radios were originally manufactured to work in. Now, the low split radios will do the amateur radio band all day, every day. The high split radios, not so much. And in fact, if you put a programming profile that has, let's say, a, a ham frequency of 442.5125 into a high split radio, and you turn the radio on, the radio is going to sit there and blink at you because it's trying to tell you, you've got a frequency in here that I don't know how to deal with. Now, this is important because if you go out on the internet and look at the used radio market, you're going to find some radios out there that are high split. And when they're put out there, that's not necessarily something that is advertised. So be very careful if you're buying an NXDN radio, or for that matter, any LAN mobile radio that you want to have work in the ham band. Make sure that it, in fact, is a low split 400 to 470 megahertz radio. Otherwise, you're going to have a radio that will be sitting there blinking at you. Now, there is, and thank goodness there is, a departure from this. ICOM's latest radio, the F5130 in the VHF band and the 6130 in the UHF band, are what are called all-band radios. So on the VHF side, it's 136 to 174. On the UHF side, this radio will operate 400 to 512. And there is some circuitry in the radio that if you, as an example, were to put in some ham frequencies, some GMRS, maybe even a T-band frequency. The radio knows how to deal with it. It will operate over the entire band. That is a major step forward and a major simplification for the manufacturing folks because now they don't have to worry about designing two radios. They just simply design one. If you are going to be operating and many of us are involved with emergency communications. If you're going to be operating in the ham band and the GR, GMRS band, FRS, land mobile, make sure that your antenna is capable of operating safely and efficiently over that spread of frequencies. If you have a fiberglass antenna, chances are it's not going to be able to do that. Fiberglass antennas tend to be cut for no more than about 6 megahertz of usable, efficient frequency space. So if it's a fiberglass antenna that's cut for the ham band, you're probably going to have very mixed or unacceptable results if you all of a sudden turn your radio over to a GMRS frequency. What's going to happen? Well, in most cases, what ends up happening is because the antenna is out of tune with the frequency that you're transmitting on, 
it's going to cause a high SWR, high reflected power, because it's not resonant. What happens when you have high SWR coming back at your radio? Well, if you thought your radio was warm when it was operating on a frequency that the antenna was built for, it's going to get a lot hotter. And what will end up happening is you'll end up effectively burning up the power amplification chip in the radio. Now, ICOM and Kenwood both have circuitry in their radios so that if the radio detects a lot of reflected power coming back, it tends to knock the power down so that even if you've got the radio set for 45 watts, you may not get more than 5 watts out of it, which may also be very unacceptable in terms of trying to reach the person or persons that you're trying to reach. So there is what's called a foldback circuit in most of these radios. But nevertheless, even with the foldback circuit, Sooner or later, you are going to toast your radio, and I'll tell you, in order to get the, the power chip replaced, which requires a lot of delicate equipment and some skill, you're probably going to pay about 300 bucks to get it done. So it's not an inexpensive proposition. What's a good wideband UHF antenna? Well, you've heard me talk about the MP antenna porcupine, which is my term for it. It's not theirs, but it's got three elements on it at 120 degrees uh, separation. Each of those elements is a slightly different length, but the antenna is designed to work 400 to 500 megahertz. It operates with a minimal amount of reflected power, and because it is a multipolarized design, it deals very effectively with bit error rate. And in fact, in testing that was done independently, in fact, right about the same time, back in 2007, MP went out, they tested this antenna, and they saw some significant improvements in bit error rate because the antenna knows how to deal with reflected signals. And you know, every time a signal is reflected, it changes phase 90 degrees. Have it reflect twice before it gets to your radio, and what are you doing? Well, you're killing your signal. At the time when MP was doing this independent testing on their own product, the West Central Florida group did something rather bold and daring. And because our good friend, who unfortunately is now a silent key, Ed Allen, WA4ISB, God love him, Ed was Mr. Broadcast Extraordinaire. And at that time, had a working relationship with the largest antenna manufacturer in the world for FM and television antennas dielectric. Ed was able to convince the folks at dielectric to bail out of Maine for three days, which is where their headquarters are located. They came to Tampa, and we did three days of field testing with a circularly polarized antenna. When all of the signals were captured, when all of the data was analyzed, we found out that the results that we got with a CP antenna at the transmitter were virtually identical to the results that the folks at MP got with the porcupine, both in terms of gain and in terms of the ability of the antenna to deal with bit error rate. So even though there are, there are only a couple of land mobile radio manufacturers out there producing circularly polarized antennas, you can effectively have and gain the effects of a CP antenna on your digital communications with the MP porcupine. 
And if anybody wants more information about that, come see me after the, the presentation. And in fact, if you've never seen it, there's one sitting on top of my car. It's been there for several years. I wouldn't be without it. Couple of operating things that we've talked about. And we talk about this on the air during our NXDN net every Wednesday night on Talk Group 1200, 730, be there or be square. Although I do understand that there are a number of folks here on Wednesday nights that can't make it because they're in church. And I'm the last guy that will try and compete with a God net. So no problems. But one of the things that we have learned, because there are multiple talk groups on the network, is when you throw your call sign out, also mention which talk group you're on. Because again, the radios have the ability to monitor multiple talk groups simultaneously. And my radio might be on 1200. Your radio might be on 1299, which is our Skywarn talk group. Or it might be on 1215 if you're down in Charlotte County. Or it might be on one of these other tactical frequencies. Or it might be on talk group one which a number of you I know use on a daily basis because you're able to keep your communications local. So announce your talk group. NB9X, talk group 1200. Or KT4WX, talk group one. Unless Daryl hasn't looked at his radio and he's still on 1200. <laughs> Sorry, Daryl, I had to, had to tweak you there. Talk group one. Here's how it works. It's real simple. If you're on using a particular repeater, let's say it's the Boyette repeater, which is right down the street, and I'm trying to talk with Ken. Ken's on the Boyette repeater, and I can be on the Boyette repeater, and we don't want to tie up the rest of the network. We just go to talk group one, and the only repeater at that point that is active is Boyette. And at the same time, while Ken and I are on Boyette, Daryl and Kyle over here may be on Bartow on Talk Group 1. The beauty of NXDN is, is that it is not a one-size-fits-all. It's not like analog. We have a great deal of granularity that is possible. And something that really can serve all of us very well. We just have to be a little bit careful of how we use it. People ask me, well, when are you going to turn the NI4CE NXDN repeater network over so we can put and use it with our hotspots? At one time, the repeaters, when the network was a bit smaller, did in fact. Uh, make itself available for hotspots. But we ran into some problems with that because when you're connected on a very large network that actually goes well beyond Florida, in fact, it can go worldwide, you might have some folks in Missouri or Germany or Wisconsin or Indiana that are using Talk Group 1200 because they think, well, it's available, I'll use it not realizing that they're bringing up a repeater network in Florida and maybe a few other places as well. Unfortunately, we had to sever that, that connection because in, in a couple of cases, it got in the way of emergency communications that needed to happen here. The NI4CE network is a radio over IP network. It is not voice over IP, which is what hotspots are. Now, we are working on a way of trying to bring the hotspots back for people here in West Central Florida. Be listening for an announcement on that in the near future. We talked before about our granularity. Talk Group 1200. It's kind of like a calling talk group. It brings up all of the repeaters at once. 
However, if we've got something going on here in West Central Florida, because, you know, now we've got a repeater up in the villages, we've got repeaters in Melbourne and down on Sanibel Island, Lee County, we cover portions of all three sections in Florida. We might have something going on that is West Central Florida centric. So at that point, if we need a general calling talk group, it'll be 1201 which in your radios is listed with a W. We mentioned 1215, which encompasses parts of Sarasota, DeSoto, Charlotte, and Lee County. 1230 through 1233 are other tactical talk groups. And in more recent days, we have also now opened up talk group 1299 for Skywarn. Yes, our National Weather Service office in Ruskin is outfitted with an NXDN radio at WX4TBW, the ham station at the Weather Service forecast office in Ruskin. And because we now have the ability to bring in tr skywarn traffic from the north and from the south, because the network now reaches into the, those areas, We've put this up on Talk Group 1299. So it keeps the traffic off of 1200, makes it very specific for Skywarn. And the one other thing that we're still working on, which I hope we'll have in place in the next month or two, is that for certain Skywarn operations where we have things going on on both NXDN Digital and on NI4CE Analog, that we will be able to combine those two networks together, particularly for our nets on Tuesday night. Future improvements. One of the things that all of your NXDN radios have is a capability called vote scan. You know how with your cell phone, you just dial a number and with all of the new towers that have been put up in the last five years, your phone call continues to work, even though the range of a particular cell tower usually isn't more than two miles. The radio just kind of figures out that if I need to jump from this tower to this tower, that it will do it. Well, vote scan is the same concept. In fact, it's not only the same concept, it's the same technology. Vote scan is a capability within your radio that reads the signal strength of the tower you're on, but also looks around to see if there are other towers that it can hear. And if the signal strength from another tower is stronger, it just automatically switches. It channel steers your radio automatically. So once you turn it on, you don't have to touch it again to change channels. We can now do this because we've got a more robust infrastructure. If you're mobile, there's virtually nowhere that you'll go in West Central Florida and not be within the reach of at least one of the NXDN repeaters. And in fact, if you're driving up US-17 through Charlotte, DeSoto, Hardy, Polk County, you've got overlap signals to beat the band. We talked about GPS coming in on NXDN being ported to APRS. We're actively working on that. Finally, before I close this session, because we're running a little bit long, for those of you who are available this afternoon at 1.30 for our afternoon session, you are going to be in for a treat. We've talked about using NXDN for voice, but we've also said in our presentations that NXDN has a messaging capability. This afternoon, you will see the debut of WX message for NXDN. This is a keyboard messaging program that works with ICOM radios that will enable you to send 
messages of up to 90 characters, because we need 10 characters for overhead. But this will enable you to send text messages of a general nature. But we call the app WX message as in weather message, because we've got some hooks in there for Skywarn, something near and dear to my heart. So if you can join us this afternoon, we are going to give you a live computer-to-computer, radio-to-radio demonstration live on the air. And for those of you who have your NXDN radio with you, We'll be operating this afternoon on one of our simplex frequencies because, Bill, unfortunately, your building here is a Faraday cage. So we're going to be operating simplex. And if you turn your radio to direct one, that's the frequency we'll be using. And you'll actually be able to read all of the messages that we're going to be transmitting from our computers back and forth. So come join us at 1.30, and you will get to see the public outing, if you will, for NXDN messaging, weather message for NXDN. There's questions on the chat that have been posted. You may read those and answer them. All right. Let's see. All right. In, in the chat portion, it says... Uh, uh, is there a mechanism to prevent or hold off 12 uh, talk group 1200 traffic on a single repeater when that repeater is occupied with talk group one? The answer is yes. In fact, that is something that our, our mad scientist programmer, Tom Chance, K9XV, is not only working on with talk group one, but also all of the talk groups. Because if, let's say, in Charlotte County, they're on 1215, they don't want to hear Talk Group 1200 traffic either. So, yes, it is, uh, it's still being tweaked a little bit, but so far the tweaks have been working. And, in fact, this last Wednesday evening, because of how this works, we actually had a hold off on starting our NXDN net at 730 because the traffic on 1215 from a Charlotte County NXDN net ran just a little bit long. Another question here. Uh, is ICOM planning to release a small NXDN HT that can be programmed with a USB-C cable? I have it on some pretty good authority that the third generation radio that ICOM is working on will incorporate USB-C which is the same technology that is now in most of your smartphones. So look for that to come. I don't know when I don't know when this third generation radio is going to be released. I know that the engineering folks in Japan are working on it. Now, will it be a small radio? That I can't tell you. But this was a first generation radio, rather large. They've shrunk the radio down to this. This is the ICOM F62D, and it's a great little radio. A little bit pricey, but it is a great radio and a great uh, great set of ears. Say again? Five watts. Five, all, all of the portables are five watts. And in fact, they're not just five watts. They're five, two, and one programmable, which is a really... Significant thing to mention, because if you're trying to do any of the new 2-watt FRS frequencies, you can actually program the radio down to 2 watts. So, anyone in here have any questions? Yes? Just what I think I have enough ham radio equipment, you show up. <laughs> <laughs> what can I tell you? Yes, Bill? Okay. We'll talk offline. All righty. Yes, sir. Excellent. 
absolutely you need a license. I mean, if you're going to operate on a ham frequency, it doesn't make any difference whether it's it's analog, digital, whatever. You've got to have a ham radio license. If you're going to operate GMRS, you need a license. They're not hard to get. Yes. If, if we go back, you know, unfortunately, I don't think I can go back here readily, but let me see if I can bring the the uh, slide back up again. Stand by. Let me let me also just share one other thing in the in the scheme of things. You know, we we have in the, the world all kinds of acronyms, races, areas. You're hearing a new one called Oxcom. Uh, not Oxcom, Oxcom. Um, here you have ham radio operators as well as others that are also being given the latitude, if they have the equipment, to be able to operate on Part 90 frequencies because their local government agency says, yes, we want you to be able to operate. Well, with one of these radios, and in fact, this happened during Hurricane Ian in Charlotte County. The hams that are part of the CC flares group down there not only operated on their amateur frequencies, but they also have programmed into their radios the NXDN frequencies for the Charlotte County Public Schools, which operated a number of emergency shelters. And they also have an emergency management repeater frequency, which is on 453 something or other in part 90, that they will be given latitude to operate on as well. And they don't only have to carry around one radio. When you ask about the frequencies, these are all of the frequencies that are part of the NI4CE NXDN network. And if you haven't got a camera to capture that, go to NI4CE.org. In the upper left-hand corner, there's a little multi-line box. Click on that and go to NXDN. That's the map that's on the on the website. These slides will be up on later today or tomorrow on the TechPod page as well. All right. So they can go download it and review it. Absolutely. And for for all things NXDN, um, go to the NI4CE website because we've got lots of information out there. A lot of the information you saw on the slides today are out there for full-time consumption. And if you have any questions, uh, we had my email address up there, but it's real easy to remember, nb9x at ni4ce.org. Yes, sir. Uh, Tom also makes DSAR. What's going on in the DSAR world? Is that sort of, you know, kind of the past? Uh, history, or are they also expanding and doing great things? Uh, D-Star is an old technology. It's been around since the the early to mid-90s. And while ICOM is still manufacturing and selling D-Star radios, they are, for the most part, just incorporating D-Star into other existing platforms, not coming out with specific D-Star-only radios anymore. And I, I don't have any insight as to how long D-Star will continue, but NXDN, I think, will overtake it. Well, and in, and in fact, here's, here's a dirty little secret. The repeaters that we have in place for NXDN are all ICOM. They're either FR6000 or FR6300 repeaters. Those repeaters will ingest and put back out an analog signal if it's analog and if we programmed it that way, or it'll be able to do analog and NXDN or NXDN only. The repeaters you see up there on the map right now are NXDN only because they operate at six and a quarter kilohertz and that's our bandwidth limitation. But the repeaters are capable of operating both ways. And here's the dirty little secret. If you, you want to put up an analog repeater and you want to buy a brand new ICOM repeater to, to, to operate that, that frequency on, you're buying a land mobile radio repeater because ICOM does not manufacture an analog ham radio only repeater. And the good news is ICOM 
Also, even though on part 90, they've got to limit the bandwidth on analog to 12 and a half kilohertz. They've had to do that for 11 years. But if you're buying it for ham radio, we can buy it all day for a 25 kilohertz operation. So with that, thank you all very much. Uh, I think I've run over my time here just a little bit, but come join us at 1.30 and you get to see the debut of weather message for NXDN, which by the way, since we have an F6400D at the Weather Service office in Ruskin, when the internet decides to break, this will be our backstop for NWS chat. Thank you.